want to read along. It may help you and may not. But uh, Genesis chapter 16. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16. What we've seen up to this point, as we've been studying through the life of Abram, is Abram walking by faith. God called him to leave behind his homeland, his comforts, his family, all sorts of everything that made life easy for him, and go to a place he'd afterwards show him. And Abram, by faith, went out, left, and wandered toward that land that God had promised to give to him. Once he gets out there, headed in the right direction, God appears to him and we find him worshiping by faith. He was an altar builder and an altered man, we observed. He built altars. He made sacrifices. He worshiped the Lord. And then we saw him warring by faith. As Lot with others were taken captive, Abram arms his household servants. They go after, recover the people, bring them back. And then we find him witnessing by faith as he gets an opportunity to share with the king of Sodom. And Sodom, uh, the king of Sodom tries to make him rich, and he says, man, I don't want anything from you. I don't want any man being able to say he made me rich. I serve the true and living God. And so he bore witness by faith. And at this point, as we get into chapter 16, what we find Abram doing, at least up to this point, is waiting by faith. Perhaps the most difficult of all the things God requires of us that we would sometimes just stand still and let Him work and let Him have His way, waiting by faith. If that were the end of the chapter, though, that would be great news. But the problem is, ten years of waiting were starting to get to Abram and to his wife Sarai even more. Now, what happens in the beginning of this chapter should give us some serious food for thought. And I've observed over the years that the very best way to learn not to do something is to look at somebody else, mess it up, see what happens in their life as a result, and then say, all right, I'm going to bypass that whole deal entirely. We don't have to learn everything by our own mistakes. We learn plenty that way, but we can learn from others' mistakes. So here we find Abram in his second major lapse of faith, last point of introduction and background. Earlier on, some years back, Abram, during a time of famine, rather than building an altar, rather than pursuing and seeking the Lord in prayer, he looked toward Egypt and he thought, man, there's plenty of food down there. Let's just go down there and take care of ourselves. Well, he went down into Egypt, ended up lying about his wife being his sister, put her at risk, publicly rebuked by a pagan king or pharaoh. And so he came out of there you know, sort of his tail between his legs, humbled and bummed. But he brought a couple of things with him, and the second of them ties into where we're going this morning as we look at chapter 16. He brought great riches. And some reading that story, you think, wow, that worked out pretty good. The guy goes down, he lies, he's a total flake, and he comes out rich. But I think every time he heard the bleeding of those many sheep that he acquired or the mooing of those many cows he acquired. And every time he looked at the riches and goods he'd acquired, they would be a reminder that, man, I failed down there. I, I miserably failed. So it wasn't all that great a deal. The second thing he brought with him was a gal named Hagar. Now, it's, it's Hag from the Hebrew and Gar from what he probably said when he saw her. And... Um, it may not actually be there in the text, but I just have a sneaking suspicion as we read this, since Sarai is the one that picked Hagar, she probably wasn't the prettiest chicken in the coop. But uh, bottom line, Sarai and Abram had waited for 10 years for the fulfillment of the promise. And it said, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Now, this is important because that's true. The Bible says that children are a gift from the Lord. I know what some of you are thinking. It's Father's Day and you're thinking, yeah, well, you haven't seen my children. You ought to come by our place sometime. No, they're still a gift from the Lord. And uh, see, the problem with our kids is relatively simple. They're a miniature version of us. See, we're big sinners. They're younger sinners, littler sinners. 
But all we've got is sinners. And we've got to work together and live together. And, and so those guys in their particular situation uh, did know. God had restrained her from bearing children. That was absolutely true. The Lord opens and closes the womb, we're told in Scripture. And so she knew the truth. And we need to ask ourselves the question, do we know the truth of the Word of God? Have we studied to show ourselves approved? When we're faced with a crisis, probably won't be this one, though it could potentially be for some. When we're faced with a crisis, do we know enough about the Word that we can go to it and stand on it, be secure in it? Well, what happens here, of course, is that Sarai, knowing that the Lord had restrained her, rather than saying, I wonder how long he's going to make us wait. Because that's all that was going on here. See, it had been 10 years. And because I've read ahead, I happen to know that, oh, it's going to be about another 15. And the promise will be fulfilled. But I don't know how many of you have waited for five years for someone to do something they promised to do, or eight years, or now ten years. And that's what's happening here. So she says, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. And though she knew that was true, she wasn't trusting him to make good on his promise. So she says, please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Now, This seems kind of bizarre to me, I have to admit. But you need to know that in that culture, this was very common. When a woman couldn't birth the child, it was perfectly legitimate culturally, as far as their society saw things, to just take one of their servants, have her husband sleep with the servant, produce a child. They would then adopt that child and raise it as their own. So culturally, this was accepted. It was common practice, probably politically correct in that day. But the problem was, though it may have been expedient, it wasn't obedient. They weren't walking by faith. They weren't trusting the Lord. And it sounds like she's just kind of going, oh man, I'm so bummed, you know, I'm not going to be able to get pregnant. Oh, if you're visiting or new to all this, it might help to know that when they first received the promise, Abram was 75. Now, I think 75-year-old guys have been known to produce a child or two. But his wife was 65, and that's a little more unusual. But you need to know, by this time, he's 85, and that makes her 75. And so it's getting to where she's saying, hey, this just isn't going to happen. It sounds like she's gently saying, hey, please just take Haggy over there, you know? And, and I'm sure that this whole thing can work out by her. She says, please... But she's failing to do a couple things that we've learned as Bible students to do. And you want to hang on to them. If you're a note taker, you want to jot them down. First of all, you want to take God at his word. If he says he'll do something, he'll do it. You want to take him literally. See, that's what happened and happens so often in Scripture. People hear this plain, simple truth of the word and they begin to say, well, do you think he really meant it literally? I mean... Is Jesus really coming back physically, literally, tangibly to establish a real kingdom on the earth? Well, that's what he said. So if we say otherwise, then we're not taking him at his word. We're not taking him literally. And in their case, perhaps Sarah began to doubt, or Sarai here, later her name will be changed. By the way, her name means cutter or cutting Sort of one of those sharp tongue gals. I know you haven't met anyone like that. But if you ever do, it'll remind you of her now. That she was sort of on him. It wasn't so much, oh, Abe, I don't think it's working out. Maybe you should go into Sarai. And I'll show you why here. Oh, a couple other things, though. Don't want to leave this behind. We need to take him at his word, take him literally. We need to know God says what he means and he means what he says. And then we need to just wait for him to fulfill his promises. You know, in the book of Isaiah, at one point, God says, look it, I'm God. There's no other God. I'm the only God. And he says, I've spoken it and I'll bring it to pass. I've said it and I will do it. God had made some radical promises, wonderful promises to them. And so far, he's made good on a lot of them. But in their doubt, they begin to despair. And in their despair, they begin to sin. So... She says, please go into my maid. Perhaps she has no guarantee. She has no promise. She's just thinking maybe, well, this is what others are doing. Maybe it'll work out for me. And then it says, Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. 
That word for voice is important because it kind of gives us some insight into what was really taking place in this conversation. The word literally can be and is translated the bleeding, the crackling, the yelling. Now, I grew up with a very gentle and loving wife, so I never had to endure this, but I've heard of people getting out of hand, you see. And uh, in our younger years, I was a little bit crazy, and Pam was a little crazy too. I, I don't want to share her testimony. And so, but the bottom line is, I've heard a little bit of bleeding and crackling in my day, but mostly a while back, at least a week or two back. But, but um, no, it's been a very long time. But what was going on there? Reminded me of a bumper sticker I saw some years back. We were cruising down the road and we saw this bumper sticker that said, treat your wife like a thoroughbred and she won't be such a nag. Um, hey, that's not a slam on gals. Happy Father's Day. Uh, it's not a slam on gals. It's saying if we husbands treat our wives the way we're supposed to, they won't be nagging at us or criticizing us or bummed about us. And what's happening here is She's crackling, she's bleeding, she's yelling. And they're in one of those, you know, something's got to be done about this situation. And in the midst of that, she makes this suggestion and Abraham says, all right, whatever, I'll do it. Now, the tragedy here is, oh, man, it is just multifaceted. First of all, there's a passage in Ecclesiastes that encourages us by telling us that two are better than one. And it says if they fall into a pit, one can help the other up. And that's what's supposed to happen in a marriage. That's what's supposed to happen with fathers and sons. That's what's supposed to happen with brothers or brothers and sisters. That's what's supposed to happen with friends. When our brother or our friend or our father or our son falls, we're supposed to help them up. When our spouse stumbles, we're supposed to help them up. And Abram, at this point, should have stood tall. He should have said, look, thanks a lot, but no thanks. I'm not interested in fulfilling the promises of God in the lust of or the energies of my own flesh. God didn't tell me to go into Hagar. And what I find happening here is a repeat of what happened down in Egypt. There's no mention of an altar. There's no mention of prayer. There's no mention of seeking the Lord to say, Lord, what do I do in this situation? How do I deal with this situation? So Abram heeded the voice, the bleeding, the crackling, the thundering, literally, of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Now, for those of you who are students of the Scripture and you've looked at the first parts of Genesis, who remembers where in Genesis God instituted the marriage relationship? It was all the way back, all the way back in chapter 2. And before there were any fathers or mothers to leave, He said a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife in the two. Not the few would become one flesh. Now, I I know this is going to sound too obvious to really need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're having problems in your relationship, husbands, wives especially, the last thing you need to do is introduce another gal into the situation or another guy into the situation. I know you think, well, who'd be that foolish? Who'd be that stupid? Oh, Abram was. Sarah was. So maybe nobody here. Maybe we're all smarter than that. Maybe our parents were all smarter than that. But I'll tell you, in our society, a lot of people, when they start the struggle, rather than confronting the struggle head on, rather than working through the problem, they just look outward. They say, hmm, maybe the solution's over there. And though this is a little bit of a different scene, I think it applies. Because the solution is never out there. It's always up there. It's always getting things right with the Lord Worshipping Him, seeking Him, obeying Him. So she says, look, it's not working out. I'm, you know, I'm 75. It's not going to happen. Take Hagar. And so he does. And she produces a child. And then in verse 4 it says, So he went into Hagar. She conceived. And when she saw she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now, this was a cultural phenomenon as well because childlessness childlessness was considered a curse. 
The Jews thought that even. And the pagans thought that. That if you couldn't produce a child, if you didn't have any children, you were cursed. Now today, a lot of people think the opposite. We live in a society where they think, man, oh, you've got kids, oh, too bad. Can't have your career, can't live your own life. But in those days, to not have a child sort of implied that something might be wrong with you. Not just physically, but otherwise, spiritually, morally, some other way. And here's what happens. And I see this, there's a point of application, a point of challenge for many of us here, I think, today in this passage. And here's why. At those times where we begin to be productive, where we begin to be fruitful, where God's actually moving in our life and working through our life, it's easy for us to become judgmental of others who are barren. We can just see them struggling. We can see they're not productive. They're not fruitful. And we can begin to look on them with at least suspicion and sometimes condemnation and think they just must not be right with the Lord. I mean, clearly, I'm blessed because I'm right with the Lord. But see, here's the problem with all of that. She was not barren at this point because of her sin. Do you see that? Do you understand? She was barren because God had decided to wait till Abe was 99 and she was 89 for her to get pregnant. Why? So long. Who knows? God says, my ways aren't your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. And certainly His timetable isn't ours. God's in eternity. Ten years is nothing to Him. Twenty years, thirty years. But for these guys... He lets them get to the point of absolute impossibility. If it seemed bizarre that a 65-year-old guy and 55 or a 75 and a 65, but a 99 and an 89, she wasn't barren because she was in sin. Now, her barrenness did lead to sin. It became a temptation. It became a trial that led her into sin. But she wasn't barren because of her sin. So we need to be careful when you see someone struggling, when you see someone whose life is obviously not what it should be, and we can see that in one another. You don't need any special discernment to know if somebody's struggling around you. But what you do need is love and compassion toward them and for them. Because they may just be going through a dry season. God may just have them somewhere preparing them for something that He wants to do that's so wonderful. He wants to make sure that everybody knows it was Him when it happens. And that's what's going down here. So Hagar begins to despise Sarai, thinking, hey, I'm the fruitful one. I'm the one who's pregnant. She's barren. And then Sarai says to Abram, my wrong be upon you. This is kind of a, a, an interesting statement. If you don't get it, let me bring it up to date. Why did you listen to me, she's saying. Everything was going fine. And yeah, okay, I told you to do it, but why did you have to listen to me? My wrong be upon you. You see what's happening? She's blaming him for their sin. Now, here's what the Bible teaches. That husbands are to be the heads of their household. I can guarantee you, after years of ministry and knowing people and interacting with couples, God didn't pick the husbands because they were smarter. He didn't pick them because they were more spiritual. He didn't pick them because they were more qualified. He didn't say, well, that looks like a good leader. I think I'll make all husbands leaders. No, here's why God chose husbands to be leaders. He wants the father in the family to be responsible for the family. And God, see, He could look down through history. He could see us in those chairs, kicked back with our remotes, you know. The kids going crazy in the yard. Our wives pulling out their hair. And honey, can you deal with that? And, and He was saying, listen, I want you to be responsible for your family. Biblically, headship is rarely about authority. Almost without exception, it's about responsibility. I'm not saying there is no authority in the structure. I'm saying it's not the primary deal. So when God puts a man as the head of the family, what's he saying? I want him to be the one who watches out, takes care for, lays a foundation spiritually, watches out for those kids. And so what she's saying is, man, you shouldn't have listened to me. You really blew it. She's blaming him. And there's a sense in which she was right. He should have, as Ecclesiastes said, stayed out of the pit and lifted her up. He should have built an altar. He should have insisted on prayer. But he didn't do any of those things. 
So my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. When she saw she conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Now Abram again, he abdicates his responsibility. He says, well, she's your servant. Do what you want with her. And at this point, we find Hagar, who has been a victim in this situation. She's been abused. She's been misused. She's been a victim. She's pregnant. And she's being tormented by Sharpie, by, by Sarai, by Cutter, who's just ripping into her day and night. So, he says, your maid is in your hand. And Sarai, verse 6, dealt harshly with her and she fled from her presence. Now, this is my favorite part of the story because it's the redeeming part. See, I really don't enjoy portions of Scripture that much where everybody's blowing it. And so far, everybody's blown it in the passage. Abram blew it because he didn't exercise godly responsibility over his family. He failed to build an altar. He failed to seek the Lord. He failed to do what was right. He allowed another woman into that that little uh, nucleus that God had created. The two had become one. And God never, though He records the sins of man, He never improves them, approves them. He never, uh, He never endorses them. He never glosses over them. By the way, if you're one of those people that thinks, well, you know, lots of sin in the Scripture. People seem to get away with it. He didn't get away with the sin in Egypt and He's not getting away with this sin. There are always repercussions. We struggle and those around us struggle because of our sin. God forgives it. God forgets it. God deals with it with us as if it never happened, but we still suffer as a result of it. Well, Sarai deals harshly. The angel of the Lord found her, verse 7, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. So the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so they shall not be counted for the multitude. Now, this is an amazing passage, this latter part, and here's why. This doesn't say an angel of the Lord, and that's what you would expect. The word angel literally is translated messenger. And there are lots of angels, good angels, fallen angels, but this is not an angel of the Lord. It is the angel of the Lord. And we'll find as we continue in our study, many passages that make reference to the angel or the angel of the Lord. And what I believe, as many do, is that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now, the incarnation simply speaks of His virgin birth, Him becoming one of us, born of the Virgin Mary. Many of you aware, of course, of that reality. But prior to all of that, Jesus existed. We're told in John's Gospel, verse 1, He was always with the Father face to face, that He created all things in Colossians, created by and for Him. And so here, here, we find the angel of the Lord. Now, here's one of the reasons, and there are many, that I believe this is actually an Old Testament appearance of Jesus prior to His becoming one of us through the virgin birth. He says, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. The same promise He made to Abram, but He's not saying God will or the Lord will. He's saying I will. And look, no angel can multiply anything. They're sexless beings. And so he's going, I'm going to multiply your descendants exceedingly so they shall not be counted for a multitude. He goes on to tell her, you're going to, you're with child and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael. Now the word is important. It literally translates God hears. So when they go home and they are going home because the angel says, go back, submit yourself. You'll be there. I'll protect you. I'll bless you. I'm going to make a nation of you. But he says, name the kid. His first place he does that. Name him Ishmael. It means God hears. And then she names the place where she sees this Savior, where God pursued her in her time of need. When she was abused, when she was refused, when she'd been cast out. God appears to her, said, 
he pursued her. He found her. She didn't find him. And he begins to pronounce blessings upon her and says, name the kid Ishmael. God hears. And then she says, I'm going to name the place too. It's the place that means God sees. He, but we're almost there. We're not quite there. He says, call him Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. And he was. His descendants, many uh, Ishmaelites as well. His hand shall be against every man, every man against his. And he dwelt, shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And those of you who've read through the Genesis, familiar with the story of Joseph later in the book in the latter portion, may recall that when Joseph's brothers were going to... They put him in this pit and they were going to let him die. And then one of the brothers kind of got an idea and they said, oh, it's not right to let our brother die. We can make a profit on him. Let's sell him. And they go and they do that. It was Ishmaelites that they sell him to, see? And so we're going to see these guys over and over again. There'll be a thorn in the sight of Israel. There'll be problems between them from that day all the way to our day and yet in the future. So she calls the name of the place, the Lord who spoke to her, you or the name of the place where the Lord spoke to her, you are the God, verse 13, who sees. For she says, have I also here seen him who sees me? She didn't just call his name. The word literally means to proclaim, to pronounce, to publish. Man, she went around saying, hey, I've seen the one who sees me. I've seen the one who watches out for me. I've seen the one who provides for me, who protects me. I've seen the one who's present with me. She began to proclaim, to pronounce the name of the Lord, to honor Him, His character, His nature, His mercy. So, check this. She goes back. And every time she mentions her son's name, this would be a reminder again of Abram and Sarai's sin. They'd say, hey, Ishmael. And what does it mean? God hears. Oh, had they just sought the Lord... And my question to you is, if you found yourself against the wall, if you've been waiting on God to come through, have you foolishly moved ahead in your own strength, made some plan? See, she couldn't conceive a child, but she could conceive a plan. But it was ill-conceived, this plan. It didn't take God into account. It didn't seek His counsel or wisdom. And I fear many of us are guilty on a daily basis of doing the same thing. Moving ahead in things where God is saying, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord that He will accomplish for you. Well, God appears. He questions. He directs. He prophesies. She proclaims His name. And we read in verse 15, Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Listen, when God makes a promise, God makes good on the promise. So what do we need to succeed? We need to know the Word of God and we need to know the God of the Word. We need to know how the Word applies to our given situation. We need to know when tempted, when tested, when confronted. What does the Bible teach about this temptation? See, Abram knew, and he should have stood his ground, but he failed to. And there would be repercussions, and there are repercussions. The same thing happens with us. My question to you today is, what are you doing with the knowledge you have of Him? If you know something to be true, are you walking by faith in it? You see, Abram started so well, walking by faith, worshiping by faith, warring by faith, witnessing by faith waiting by faith, but he failed when he decided, I just can't wait anymore. He wavered in his faith. And if that's you, God wants to restore you today. If you've stopped trusting in the promises of God and gone out to try to accomplish His work in your own energies, listen, just confess that and repent of it today. If God has promised something to you and you're waiting on Him and you're just like, Lord, I don't know if I can wait anymore. You can. You will find Him faithful to His Word. When we're faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. So, here's what the Scripture says. If perhaps you see yourself in Abram, 
maybe you haven't done all you knew you should have done. Maybe you knew what was right to do in a situation. You absolutely have blown it, walked away, completely messed it up. All you need to do is come back to the altar. And we don't actually build altars in these days, and that's because the cross of Jesus Christ replaced the need for such sacrifices. The Bible says that Jesus died for our sins upon that cross, that He was buried and He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. In every altar Abram built, in every sacrifice he made, in every altar Moses built or others would build, in every sacrifice made, pointed us to the cross. So today, if you see yourself in Abram, maybe you've blown it badly. And you know there'll be some ramifications. There there will be some situations. You're going to deal with it. Know this. God wants to forgive you, though. He wants to restore you. He's for you, not against you. So you come to the cross. Maybe like Sarai, you've given some really bad counsel and you've watched people suffer as a result and done some suffering yourself as a result. Maybe you've grown impatient with the Lord and just gotten out there on your own. Confess it. He's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. Maybe like Hagar, you've been abused, misused, taken advantage of, cast out. If that's you, then today... You need to know God's for you. And He looks out for the wounded, for the hurting, for the castaway. And He pursues, reveals Himself. I pray He does that for you today so you can not only find His forgiveness, but so you can forgive those who've sinned against you. And we're going to bow our heads in a moment. And I'm going to ask believers just to deal as the Lord's moving on your heart. You can believe He's used this passage in my heart. He has given me so many incredible promises. And I know they're His. I know they're from Him. Absolutely. And so often I've grown faint-hearted and, and begin to think, well, what can I do? What can I do? And, and I just need to wait and trust. If that's you, man, just trust the Lord. And He will bring it to pass. If you're not a believer in Jesus, it's relatively simple. The Bible says God created you and He loves you because you are His creation and loves His very nature. But the Bible says that sin has separated you from holy God. Not only is He loving, but He's holy, so separated because of sin. And when an unbeliever becomes a believer, all you're really doing is saying, Lord, I do recognize You created me and You love me and sin has separated us and I do accept the sacrifice and believe in and trust in the sacrifice Jesus made on my behalf. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus today, you can. So Lord, I thank You for this opportunity to open Your Word. And I know, Lord, that there are many here who've heard from You that know better, Lord, that have precious promises yet to be fulfilled. And Lord, for any and all of us who've try to accomplish Your work in the energies of our own flesh. Lord, today we ask forgiveness, knowing that You've promised if we confess our sin, You're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we confess today we want Your will, Your way. Show Yourself strong on our behalf. Fulfill those promises You've made to hearts. And Lord, I pray for any and all who've run from You, rebelled against You, that Lord, You'd restore them as well, that You'd draw them to that full appreciation of the perfection of Your plan for their lives. Open their eyes to the foolishness of running from You, rebelling against You. Lord, I pray as well for those who've been misused, abused, those, Lord, who feel victimized by people, by society, by situations. I pray, Lord, that today they would see you as Hagar did. That they would hear from you and say, I've heard from God. And and that they would see that you're here for them. Lord, I pray that lives will be changed, transformed as a result of our time together. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus... Hey, that's the fundamental issue of life. Believers know they need confessing. 
And uh, God's going to forgive and cleanse and make it right. But if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus, the Scriptures say if you don't believe He is who He claimed to be and came and did what He came to do, to die for your sin, according to the Scripture, to be buried and rise again the third day, if you don't believe and receive, you'll die in your sin. And there'll be no hope after that. There's no second chance. There's no coming back and giving it another shot. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus and you want to do that right now, well, every head's bowed, every eye's closed. They're praying for you because they came the same way. Anyone this hour, this service, want to give your life to the Lord Jesus for the very first time, and so I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high and I'll pray for you. And you will be born again, forgiven every sin. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, ready to give your life to the Lord Jesus. Just another moment. Lord, we're aware and take so great comfort in the fact that you've promised your word will never return void. That, Lord, you've gathered us together, a divine appointment for every heart, for every person here. And you're all about restoration, Lord. I pray that today would be a day of restoration. As we open our hearts afresh to you, as your forgiveness, Lord, washes away and washes over, cleanses and covers every sin. Thank you for loving us, for choosing us, for sending your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you for the mercy and peace that we found as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all...